What is the activity of victory? That's my question for you today. What is the act? What do victorious people act like? What is the victory in Christ? Well, here's my answer to you. The activity of victory is rejoicing. What should mark the life of the believer is the rejoicing and the thanksgiving and the exuberant praises to God. Why? We have been made so much victorious, healed, overcoming, that we should always have a praise for God who has done so much for us. Amen? That's the activity of rejoicing. Praise the Lord and thank you for tuning in today. My name is Michelle Steele. This is the Faith Builders broadcast and I desire to share the word of God with you today concerning the victory that we have in Christ. This is lesson 12 of a 12 lesson series called In Christ Volume 1. This is the study guide that goes along with this series. We have the DVD formats, the CD formats, the other things, the study guide is available for download as a PDF or you can order the printed copy. But the teaching that we've gone over is so important to our life in Christ for us to be able to live from this position of who we are in Christ. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We have, have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. There are things that are ours because of our position in Christ, but they cannot be accessed any other way except for our position in Christ. You know, there was a time, well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that, that started me on this study some years ago was I was dealing with a problem in my family. I was, I was praying for a family member and it was one of my children. I was praying from my position as a mother. And I thought that was a pretty important position, you know, cause that's my baby. And I was praying and I was praying out all I could pray. And I was, I was using all that was available to me in my position as a mother. And I was not seeing any change in my life in, in, in this person's life and in the situation. And I came to an end of that and ask the Lord, what am I doing wrong? How come my prayers don't seem to be moving very farther? And I, I know we don't walk by, by sight, but I knew in my spirit, I wasn't making any spiritual headway in this situation. And the Lord said to me, uh, you're, you're dealing with this from your position as a mom, but if you'll take your place in Christ, there's a lot more equipment for you there. There's a lot more armament for you in your position in Christ. From my position as a mother, I wasn't operating the same things that I can operate when I get over in the spirit and take my place in Christ. And I did. I started changing the way I dealt with that situation. And instead of praying from what I was seeing and praying from my emotions, I began to walk in Christ and I began to pray from my place in Christ. And so this affects every area of our life and we've covered so much. I know you'll want the whole set. So please, the information is going to be available to you uh, at the end of the broadcast. I, I encourage you to take the opportunity to receive a, this resource that's available. Another resource that also corresponds with this teaching is my book, Redeemed and Righteous by Nature. And this goes into a little more detail of uh, certain things, especially the righteousness that you are in Christ. We spent about four weeks in this series, but this book really aims at the righteousness that you are in Christ and how to be established in that righteousness it has a study guide as well. So you can follow along with the chapters and it has a place of, of questions. You can answer the questions. You can use these for uh, uh, your own personal study or for a family group, home group, something to that effect to help you. Our desire is to provide resources to help you grow. And, and we, we are endeavoring to put in your hands things that you can, you can pull it out and put it to practice right away in your life. Praise God. 
thank you to all of my partners. I'm so grateful. If you're watching today and you have ever, never had the opportunity or never taken that opportunity to become a partner with this program, please be a part of this Faith Builders Partner Family because we are seeing many lives transformed, equipped, changed, strengthened by the Word of God, and you're helping make that happen, those of you who are partnering with us. When you partner with a ministry, you know, this is God's design. He he put partnership in the scripture. We see that David set a precedent when those that were traveling with him, when they were trying to recover all that had been stolen by the Amalekites, there was a group that said, we can't go any further. And he, they un unloaded all of their stuff. And they said, then you stay here and you watch over our stuff and we'll run faster, not being as heavily laden down with these burdens and we'll be able to do more. And they did. They were able to catch up with the enemy. They recovered all. And when they came back and encountered and they got all of their family back, all of their resources back. But then when they found the group that had stayed behind, there was some people that said, well, it's not fair for them to get an equal share. And, the, and he said, it is fair because we would never have been able to do what we did if they would not have stayed here with our stuff and enabled us to go. And so when you partner with the ministry, it's that same concept. You enable us to go. You help us enter into the houses and into more houses to minister to people. We have our broadcast in English and in Spanish, not a dubbed over uh, version of the English, but actually preaching it in Spanish uh, to uh, throughout the nation. We're in English and in Spanish ministering the gospel, and you're a part of that through partnership. We want to bless you as a partner with this book, Pressure No Problem. It's my first book. This is the expanded edition, so it's been released uh, over again with a little bit more added to it. But these are, are keys that God gave me in my beginning of walking in Christ to help me know how to overcome pressure so that you can say pressure no problem. It's our gift to you. As I said, this is lesson 12 of this 12 part series. And we have been talking about our position in Christ. Today, we're going to talk about our victory in Christ. We've been on that for the last few sessions. And we're going to talk about the activity of victory, the activity of our victory. One of our foundational scriptures has been 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and it will never grow old, let me tell you. So let's read it again. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and remember, in Christ is a definite location, a fixed location. In the original language, it's one word. So this being in Christ is what happens when I have been made new, born again by receiving Jesus as Lord. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. So whether you know it or not, whether you feel like it or not, whether there's any natural evidence to it or not, you are a new creature in Christ. You have to learn to live out of that new creature that you are. You have to learn how to live from that you in Christ and no longer yield to the, the old way of responding or the old way of choosing. But this victory in Christ is part of the inheritance in Christ. We have spent many of our, our sessions talking about that foundation of Jesus doing the substitutionary work. Jesus became sin for us. Second Corinthians 5 21. Jesus was cursed for us. Galatians 3 chapter 13 or chapter 3 verse 13. He was cursed. He was made a curse for us. He did that. He, it says he bore our sins in the cross in, in first Peter 2 24. He he bore them so that we could live unto righteousness. He, he took the stripes on his back so that we would be made whole or healed. He became 
poor with our poverty so that we could be made rich with his riches. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine. So when we look at those, those substitutionary works, those are completed. Those are done. Those are ours in Christ. And in that, we also find out that we are heirs of God. Romans chapter eight says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So this heir means that we are inheritors or we have a inheritance with God equal with the inheritance that Jesus receives. I know you think, what? I, I did too, but it's in the Bible. I mean, what are you going to do? Can you tear that page out and still, uh, you know, say, I, I was, no, you can't tear it out. You have to say, if the Bible says that I am a joint heir with Christ, then I'm just going to say it too. I'm not, I'm not lying. I'm saying what he said and he can't lie. So you are an heir and part of your inheritance is victory. Jesus didn't need to gain victory over poverty for himself. He didn't need to gain victory over sin for himself. He didn't need to, need to gain victory over the curse for himself. All of those things he did for us. And he didn't need to come and defeat Satan for himself. He defeated Satan for us. He defeated death, hell, and the grave for us. That victory was attained for us. And so we've talked about that victory and, and you can't talk about it too much. You, you've got to give your focus to it. We've learned that you've got to give more earnest heed to this great salvation we've heard proclaimed so that it doesn't slip away, so that it doesn't become something casual to us or something that we think it's just what the Bible says. No, what the Bible says is how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live in victory over sin, over sickness, over death, over hell, over the grave. We're supposed to operate the victory in Christ. And so this, this victory is ours. And what is the activity of victory? That's my question for you today. What is the act? What do victorious people act like? What is the victory in Christ? Well, Here's my answer to you. The activity of victory is rejoicing. What should mark the life of the believer is the rejoicing and the thanksgiving and the exuberant praises to God. Why? We have been made so much victorious, healed, overcoming that we should always have a praise for God who has done so much for us. Amen. That's the activity of rejoicing. Let's look here in uh, Galatians chapter five and verse 22. It's talking about the fruit of the spirit. It says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. This is what is produced in our lives through our connection with Jesus. And you can see everything in it is beneficial. Everything listed here in the fruit of the, the spirit is beneficial. And notice joy is right there in the n place number two in this list, love and joy. Joy is a fruit or uh, something that is produced in my spirit as a result of my connection to Jesus in the vine. He is the vine. I am the branch. My connection to him provides the life that is in the, the vine to be flowing in me, the branch. And so that life is a life of love. That life is a life of joy. That life is a life of peace. That life is a life of long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. These are the characteristics of who God is. And we are his children. These, we're going to live like this and act like this and be like this because we are of God, born of God. Jesus is joyful by nature. We're joyful by nature. Why? We just listed the nature of God that lives on the inside of us. Love, joy, peace. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Continue down that list. Those are the characteristics of God's nature. Well, Jesus is joyful by nature and God is joyful by nature. God the Father. They both sing and laugh. 
So if we're supposed to be imitators of God, <laughs> like little children, we should do what they do. We should do what Jesus does. We should do what the Father does. I'm going to give you some scripture, okay? Listen, Zephaniah 317 says, The Lord God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. So notice it refers to God joying as it says, he will rejoice over you with joy. He will joy over you. Now I know we don't use that verb the word joy as a verb very often, but the Bible does. So I think believers should incorporate that. I, I, what are you doing right now? I'm joying. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're in there lifting your hands saying, thank you, Lord. Praise God. What are you doing? I'm joying. It's a verb in the Bible that pertains to the father. The father, it says he will joy over you. How does he do it? With singing. He is rejoicing over you with joy, joying over you with singing. The Father is joyful by nature. Psalm 32 and verse 7. You are a hiding place. This is Amplified Bible. You are a hiding place for me. You, Lord, preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs and shouts of deliverance. You surround me with songs of deliverance. And the Amplified goes on and amplifies that and says songs and shouts of deliverance. So God sings and God shouts. Hallelujah. God sings over us and he's rejoicing over us and his songs are protective over us. His songs, when God says, I am your keeper, I am your protector, that song goes around our life and the enemy says, I can't get to him. God's singing over them. It also says in Hebrews chapter one and verse nine, Speaking of Jesus, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Speaking of the anointing on Christ, the anointed one and his anointing, it is a gladness, an oil of joy, the oil of gladness. And it is upon Jesus. And if we're in Christ, that means it should be on us as well. Hebrews 2 verse 12 from the Amplified says, For he says, I will declare your, the Father's name to my brethren. I will declare, declare your name to my brethren. Jesus is speaking of the Father in that. In the midst of the worshiping congregation, I will sing hymns of praise to you. Jesus said, I will sing hymns of praise. So the Father sings and Jesus sings. I, I look forward to hearing them sing, don't you? Luke 10, 21. In that same hour, speaking of Jesus, he rejoiced and gloried. This is the Amplified. In that same hour, he rejoiced and gloried in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you concealed these things. So he goes on and he prays that prayer. But notice, he rejoiced and gloried in the Holy Spirit. In that, uh, before he entered into prayer to ask God anything, he rejoiced and gloried in the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus rejoices, if God the Father rejoices, if they're joyful by nature, if they are singing, we also are to enter into that activity of victory and rejoice. When you see this in Luke 10, 21, the Greek word used for rejoice here is a word that suggests shouting and leaping for joy. So this shows me Jesus wasn't just, hum, just silently, I rejoice over you, Father. He was shouting and leaping according to the word that is used in the Greek language over rejoicing. So you and I are to enter into that same activity of victory, that rejoicing before the Lord. Jesus brought up joy in the conversation that he had before the cross in John chapter 15. He's dealing with very important issues in this last conversation he's having with his disciples. And he brings up joy a number of times. He says this in chapter 15 and verse 11 of the book of John. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. 
Jesus said, he's given you his joy. You add it to your joy and you're going to have a fullness of joy. We also see that Jesus wants us not to have a half a measure of joy, a, 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 a three quarters of a measure. He wants your joy full. He wants your joy overflowing. And he spoke about keeping relationship with him and his word to provide for that flow of joy. He says in John chapter 16, now therefore you have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice. He's still in this conversation before the cross. And he says, when after, after that, after he has effected salvation, he says, your joy, no man will be able to take from you. No man taketh from you. In that day, you'll ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the father in my name, he will give it to you before now you've asked, asked nothing in my name, ask and you receive so that your joy might be full. So we see two times in once in chapter 15, one in chapter 16, that Jesus wants our joy full. Why? We've been placed in Christ. We've been put in a position of victory. We have inherited our salvation. We have inherited uh, the blessing. We have inherited healing. We've inherited uh, freedom from, from uh, the curse, from sickness. Uh, we've inherited eternal life. We're never going to die. When we are absent from the body, we're going to be present with the Lord. I think we've got something to rejoice about. And he wants our joy full. So he explains in these verses, specifically in verse 22, he explains that this joy is not something that others will be able to take away from you. And then he explains that receiving by asking in his name is one of the keys. And I think there are a lot of people who have not learned the authority they have in Jesus name. And that's why they don't have fullness of joy because they're not operating in this key. He says that it's a key to receiving and producing fullness of joy. The living Bible says your cup of joy will overflow. So ask yourself this question. Is my current level of joy important? If the scripture says he wants you to have full joy, and that's the will of God for your life, it should be our desire to reach and to maintain that full level of joy. And joy is not a response to the activity or the current situation. It is a focus on who God is and what he's done for you. Our joy is full because our salvation is complete. We're complete in Christ. We've been made the righteousness of God with Christ Jesus. So when we rejoice, it is like flipping on the switch or you could say opening the app of joy. It is, it is starting the engine of your joy. It is the rejoicing is the activation of the joy that's available to us in our spirit. So if you're not rejoicing, you can have joy and not even know it. You can have joy available to you and not even experience it. The basis of our joy is the Lord. I love how Habakkuk chapter three talks about even if the figs don't blossom and there's no fruit on the vines and it goes through all this whole list of things, even if none of these things happen, I will rejoice and exult in the victorious God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, my personal bravery, and my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk, not to stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, of suffering, or responsibility. So even if nothing else looks like it's going right in my life, my rejoicing doesn't change because my God hasn't changed. And my rejoicing doesn't change because my salvation doesn't change. And we are instructed to rejoice. Our spiritual momentum is found in the flow of joy. The Bible tells us rejoice in the Lord always. It says rejoice evermore. The new living says, be full of joy all the time. Isaiah 51 11 says that it's the way that we travel, that it is our momentum or our flow. It says the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Psalm 97 tells us that 
our joy brings light into our situation. If you think about it, light and darkness go together or light and gladness go together and darkness and sadness go together. It says in Psalm 97, light is sown for the righteous. Hallelujah. And when we verbally express our joy in that rejoicing, God comes out to meet us. It is said in Isaiah 64, 5, God meets him that rejoices. When you express your joy, you are trusting in the Lord. That activity of rejoicing is saying, I trust in God. Let all that put their trust in you rejoice, Psalm 511 says. And 1 Peter chapter 7, it says in the Message Bible of verse, uh, it says, you trust in him with laughter and in singing. The Amplified says, though you do not even now yet see him, you believe in him and exult and thrill with inexpressible and glorious triumphant heavenly joy. I believe and because I believe, I rejoice. That is the activity of my victory, the rejoicing in the Lord. In Christ is your position. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've been blessed by these teachings. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The Bible uses this phrase, in Christ, to reveal the position of the believer. Through the light of the scriptures, we can see the full picture of who we are in Christ. The series, In Christ, Volume 1, is exactly what you need to shine the light on the position you have as a believer in Christ Jesus. In this series, Michelle Steele explains what it means to abide in Christ, the process of maturity, how Jesus is our justifier, the victory that He gives us, and much more. This insightful 12-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. In addition, we are offering Michelle's companion book, Redeemed and Righteous by Nature, and the companion workbook. In this book, Michelle describes the righteousness of God we have been made in Christ Jesus that enables us to approach our Heavenly Father with confidence. As you develop in your right standing with God, you can experience fruit in your prayer life and walk and exercise authority over the enemy. If you desire to experience the fullness of who you are in Christ, this book is for you. The workbook is a great addition that can be used for personal study or small groups. This essential book about the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus can be yours for just $15. Add the workbook for just $10 and you will be prepared to enter into a solid foundation of your position in Christ. Don't miss this special offer, the 12-part series, In Christ, Volume 1, and the companion book, Redeemed and Righteous by Nature, working together to shine the light on your position in Christ. Call the number on your screen or go to buildfaith.net to order. Call or go online now. We want to say thank you for watching Faith Builders and would like to invite you to become a partner with this ministry. With your partnership, you help make it possible for the Word of God to be spread across the world. You can call us at 1-586-5080 or visit us online at buildfaith.net. You can also write us at P.O. Box 242-692, Little Rock, Arkansas 72223. Together, we are building people's faith and framing their world by the Word of God. Join us at buildfaith.net for faith-building teaching and live services from your computer, phone, or tablet. You can also watch live services on Sundays, Wednesdays, and special events.